Well, good morning. It's a joy to be worshiping with you this morning. It's a joy that fall is finally here too, isn't it? Praise the Lord for some of that. That is a, that is a gracious and nice thing. I think we ought to pray for some rain soon too, don't you? We are dry. We need some rain. And the Lord is the one who sends the rain. I have a lot of fun with our students over at the seminary. And uh, I enjoy being with them. Making sure you hear me all right. Okay, very good. Thank you. Um, I enjoy being with them. And every once in a while, I will throw out a question... And I get some wonderful responses to it. But every once in a while, I throw out a question and I get that deer in the headlight look. And this morning, we're going to talk about one of those questions. Why is Jesus coming again? Now, this message is related to the Lord's table because, you know, there are references in Jesus instituting the Lord's Supper about What's going to happen someday? And he talks about how he has denied himself something he allows us to participate in. Isn't our Lord amazingly humble and gracious? He's denied himself this because he wants us to be home with him when he participates. He's waiting for us. What a gracious Lord we have. I want you to take your Bibles and turn with me to Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24. Now, I'm going to do something this morning that I very, very seldom ever do. There are basically two types of sermons. You know those. You've heard Johnny talk about those more times than I can count. Johnny is an expositor, always will be, uh, loves that. And I I tend to, uh, along those same lines, what does that mean? He's probably told you time and again what that means. It means he takes a passage of Scripture and he tries to wring all the truth out of it that he can. And I love that. I think there's a power in that. There's a richness in that. But this morning, because of this question and the subject matter, and because it's addressed in different areas of Scripture, we're going to look at several things this morning. So I'm going to do something I normally don't do. I'm going to preach a topical message. Sometimes we just need to look at a subject or look at a topic and see what God's Word says on it. And that's what we're going to do this morning in light of coming to the Lord's table. And I hope this morning that what is shared will not only increase your faith, strengthen your faith, but also will equip you to have this conversation with other people that you're around as they perhaps need to prepare their hearts for the Lord's coming. Why is Jesus coming again? Let's read from Matthew chapter 24 beginning in verse 29. Jesus says this, Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven. And then all the tribes of the earth will mourn and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and with great glory. And He will send His angels with the great sound of a trumpet and they will gather together His elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. Now learn this parable from the fig tree. When its branch has already become tender and puts forth leaves, you know that summer is near. So you also, when you see all these things, know that it is near at the very door. Truly I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words by no means will pass away. Isn't that a comfort to us? Let's pray together. Father, thank you for Jesus Thank you that He is coming again. Thank you that He's going to prepare a place for us. Thank you, Father, that we can be cleansed from sin by His blood and equipped and prepared for that place by Your Holy Spirit as we cry out to Christ and You give us that sweet and precious gift of faith. Thank you for who You are. Thank you for how great You are. Father, hide this man and magnify Christ this morning. In His holy name, amen. Folks, we're to live ever ready for Jesus appearing. You know, He gives us some signs of of His coming, and He tells us that it will come 
in a general season of those signs, but he also says to us that it will come with amazing suddenness. This is what I propose for the minutes that remain as we prepare for the Lord's table. If you listen and follow along with me, I think that we can shed some light on a subject that many consider a bit confusing, the second coming of our Lord and our Savior. Why? This is a question I want us to think about. What is called the Christian's blessed hope? The blessed hope of the Christian. Let me give you a little background, if I may. Christ's first coming is the foundation of our faith, the very foundation of our faith. We are Christian precisely because a man named Jesus, who proved himself to be the Christ, the Messiah, came into the world, died for our sins, and rose again on the third day. Amen? We are Christian. We are here, gathered this morning because of that. But did you know that the second coming of the Lord is spoken of twice as many times in Scripture? It is the focal point of all of history, of the unfolding history of the earth where the Lord will make His statement and make Himself known. The second coming is called the Christian's blessed hope. Think about that statement. The Christian's blessed hope. All our worries will be over when Jesus comes. Did you get that? All our fears will be relieved when Jesus comes. All our bills, our mortgages, our health concerns will be no more when Jesus appears. Death and dying, sin and separation will be done away with. As the old song says, when Christ shall come. But I've encountered, as I said, that deer in the headlight look when I asked students, Why is Jesus coming again? The Bible tells us why. So this morning as we approach the Lord's table, I want to share with you a few brief reasons and us to focus on why Jesus is coming again. First thing, Jesus is coming again to gather His own. He's coming again to gather His own. We just read it, didn't we, in Matthew chapter 24? By the way, Matthew chapter 24 and he he goes on, but this is called the great eschatological discourse. The Greek word eschatos means final or last things. So he's talking about the last days of history, the last days of earth. He's coming again to gather his own. I want to just read you something here from John chapter 14, a very familiar passage. Jesus speaking on the night he was betrayed said this to his own. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions or dwelling places. And if it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. The Lord is coming to gather His own. Are you one of His own this morning? You can become one of His own by believing and calling out to Him in faith. What comfort and hope this should give us. When the Lord Jesus was preparing to leave His disciples, He wanted them to take comfort. He tried to comfort them. John 14 is called the great comfort chapter. It's not just called called the comfort chapter because Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. It's called the comfort chapter because there's a great talk there about the comforter, the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, though, I go to prepare a place for you. And literally in the Greek, he says, and since I'm going to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. For what purpose, Lord? So that where I am, there you may be also. Did you get that? The Lord wants us to be with Him in heaven. And He wanted it enough, He wanted it so badly, that He would leave heaven, its glory, its majesty, its beauty, its splendor, and the worship do Him, and come to earth, and die for our sins, and rise again. Jesus wants you to go to heaven. Jesus wants you to go to heaven. He desires that human beings receive the free gift of eternal life that He offers so that when He comes, He will gather His own from the sea of humanity. As we open the book of Revelation, we will in a few minutes. In the first few verses, we should note that the first thing on Jesus' mind, and I don't mean this crudely, the first thing on Jesus' mind when all hell is about to break loose on earth is His bride, the church. Aren't you glad? Listen, you ever hear about an earthquake in a place or a hurricane in a place or some kind of attack in a place? And if you know somebody personally there, you're buying racist to that person. You have a concern about their welfare. The Lord Jesus is concerned about His bride, the church. Praise God for that. Folks, you should thrill our hearts that we matter to Jesus. 
He's coming back to gather His own. 1 Thessalonians 4.16 says, Those who have died in Christ shall rise first. Then, then, we which are alive and remain shall be called up together with them to meet the Lord in the air. And I love the last part of that. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Folks, Christ is coming to gather His own. This morning, you need to make sure you're one of His own. Second thing, Christ is coming to sit as judge. He's coming to sit as judge. Now, folks, that may make us a little weak in the knees. That may give us a little fear in the pit of our stomach. But, but the Lord is a glorious judge. Isn't He? He's going to right what's been done wrong in this world. That ought to thrill our hearts if we love righteousness. He's coming to sit as judge. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. Let me read you this passage, if I may. Just a few verses here. Verses 6 and following say this. Well, let me go back to verse 5 because it's intro. Which is manifest evidence of the righteous judge of God that you may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you also suffer. Listen to this. Since it is a righteous thing with God to repay with tribulation those who trouble you. And to give you who are troubled rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with His mighty angels. In flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. These shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power when He comes in that day to be glorified in His saints and, be, and to be admired among all those who believe because our testimony among you was believed. Folks, that's nothing to yawn at right there. Is that, am I right? I mean, what a glorious thing to think about. He's coming to sit as judge. Brother Tim, why is he coming to sit as judge? Because when 2,000 years ago as he walked upon this earth, men falsely accused him and horribly judged him. Didn't they? You ever read seriously and analyzed the trials of Jesus? They weren't trials at all. They were illegal trials, even according to Jewish law. It was a mockery of a trial. Nowhere in the annals of jurisprudence, that's fancy words, just meaning the rule of law, Nowhere will you find someone who is repeatedly declared not guilty and then condemned to die. So we have to look for a deeper meaning for the death of Jesus. Jesus didn't die for anything He had done. He didn't die because He was unrighteous. He died because you and I were unrighteous. He died in our place. And as men falsely accused Him and judged Him, He's coming to judge the earth. Many poke fun at Jesus even to this day. Many speak falsely about Jesus. And foolishly judge Him. But folks, make no mistake about it. There is a day coming, and it is closer than it has ever been, when the Lord Jesus will sit and will judge this world. He's coming as judge. That judgment will be in two places. And we could make a point that it will be in three phases. What do you mean, Brother Tim? Here it is. Christ will judge His own. He will judge His own. He will judge you and me. But this will not be a judgment about life and death. Because if you're one of His own, your judgment about life and death was decided at Calvary and Jesus took your death for you. And that's part of what you accept by faith. But rather that judgment will be a judgment as to faithfulness and a judgment as to rewards. By the way, that's called the Bema, B-E-M-A, or the judgment seat of Christ. He's coming to judge His own. But secondly, Christ will judge the unrighteous. Those who have rejected Him. This is the subject of 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. And this judgment is chronicled for us in detail in Revelation chapter 20. It is referred to as the great white throne judgment. Note there that the ones who appear are sentenced to the lake of fire or the second death. Brother Tim, that scares me. It scares me too. It should scare us all. I agree. Folks, that's why we need to be sharing the gospel. I'm not scared of the great white throne because I'm going to be standing there because I know that my faith is in Jesus Christ. But that is a subject of awful solemnity and something that we need to be serious about. Brother Tim, what's the third phase that you speak of? I'm speaking of the great tribulation. 
It's referenced in what we just read, spoken of as we already alluded to in Matthew 24 and 25 in that great eschatological discourse. Folks, there's a real sense, you may not realize this, but there's a real sense that the tribulation is part of God's judgment upon this earth for what it did to Christ and what it's done to His people for the last 2,000 years. In Revelation 22, 12, the last chapter of the entire Bible, Jesus says, Behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give to every man according as his work shall be. Folks, his regal robe of splendor is being prepared. Christ is coming to sit as judge. I'm glad he's coming. All the injustice in this world, all the cruelty in this world, all the violence in this world, All the crime in this world, he's coming to make things right. We ought to rejoice in that. We ought to rejoice in that. He's coming to sit as judge. So the third thing I want you to see. Christ is coming to restore creation. Christ is coming to restore creation. Let me read you from Romans chapter 8, verse 19 and following. This is what the Word says. It says, For the earnest expectation of the creation... Uh, eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. Listen to this. For the creation, it's talking about the material world, was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. Isn't that good news? For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. And not only that, but we also who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, eagerly awaiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. What's he saying? When the Lord comes to complete our redemption, he's going to redeem the world too. That is the material creation. When Adam sinned, all... The earth under his dominion was thrust into chaos. Chaos has been much of life and history ever since. Violence in nature, from the food chain to storms and earthquakes and all kinds of destruction. Isn't that right? It's all over. It's all around. Folks, there's been untold suffering in this world throughout history. From diseases to plagues to wars and violence and suffering and death. But there is a day appointed, praise God. A day appointed when creation itself will have the curse once put upon it removed. Jesus is coming to remove it. And the Lord Jesus, who paid the price to remove that curse, will reign over it all. Praise God. The lion will lie down beside the lamb. Scripture says children will play near the den of asp because all danger will be removed. And it appears that the earth will be restored to... It's beautiful Edenic state. That is like Eden. Why is Jesus coming? He's coming to gather His own. Why is Jesus coming? He's coming to judge the righteous and the unrighteous. Why is Jesus coming? He's coming to restore creation. But there's a fourth thing I want you to see. Christ is coming to unveil His glory. He's coming to unveil His glory. I want to... uh, read you just a few verses from Revelation chapter 1. John speaks of uh, that day when he was... Listen to what he says, verse 10. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice as of a trumpet, saying, I am the Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. And what you see, write in a book, and send it to the seven churches which are in Asia to Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamos, to Thyatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. And then I turned to see the voice that spoke with me. And having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands, or candlesticks. And in the midst of those lampstands, one like the Son of Man, listen to this description, clothed with a garment down to the feet and girded about the chest with a golden band. His hair and his head were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes like a flame of fire. And his feet were like fine brass, as it is refined in a furnace, and his voice was as the sound of many waters. And he had in his hand 
In his right hand, seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and with it, and his countenance was like the sun, shining in all of its strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying to me, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am he who lives and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. Jesus is coming to... Rev- to unveil his glory I think about Isaiah you know some scholars refer to the book of Isaiah in the Old Testament as the fifth gospel did you know that because there's so many glimpses of the Messiah 700 years before the Lord Jesus came the prophet Isaiah was given glimpses of him and in those suffering servant passages in Isaiah chapters 52 and 3 Isaiah speaks of the blessed one who was coming And he says there that there is no comeliness in him or anything that we should desire him. What does that mean? It means that part of Jesus' humiliation, part of the Lord Jesus' humbling on this earth is that the Prince of Heaven who possessed all glory should have his beauty and splendor and majesty and glory veiled. Christ, though beautiful in his person beyond compare, as a man on earth was likely not handsome or winsome. And note the passage where we begin our study. Jesus says, He is coming again, and every eye will see Him and shall mourn Him, and His coming will be with the clouds of heaven and with, listen to these words, great glory. Great glory. Philippians 2 says, Because Jesus humbled Himself and was obedient unto death, even the death of the cross, what does that mean? It's the worst death any man could die. God has given Him a name which is above every name. But when the Apostle John We just read it. When the Apostle John, John, arguably Jesus' closest friend on the earth, John, who was part of Jesus' inner circle with his brother and the Apostle Peter, John, who was on the Mount of Transfiguration, John, who was but a stone's throw away in Gethsemane, John, who leaned on Jesus' breast at the Last Supper, John alone uh, among those who dared to be at the cross, This same John, when he saw the Lord Jesus in all of his glory, he fell at his feet as a dead man. Christ was despised on earth. Christ was rejected by men on earth. Christ was rejected by his own on earth. He came into his own, but John says in John 1, his own received him not. And folks, for all these reasons... It is fitting and right that He be glorified and that His glory and that His courage and that His unspeakable character, that His immeasurable strength, that His untold sacrifice, that His beauty, that His unselfishness, that His magnificence be acknowledged and applauded by all the earth. This is who He is. And He's coming to unveil His glory. And every knee will bow and every tongue confess to the glory of God the Father that Jesus Christ is Lord. But folks, there is a blessedness, there is a promise, there is a beauty, there is a life-giving power to those who will profess Him as Lord now before they are conscripted to do so. Why is Christ coming? He's coming to unveil His glory. But there's a fifth thing. Christ is coming to usher in His kingdom and reign forever. Isn't that good news? We're in Revelation chapter 1. Go over to Revelation chapter 19. Revelation 19. In the interest of time, I'm just going to read two verses there. Verse 11, Now I saw heaven open, behold, a white horse, and he who sat on him was called Faithful and True, and in his righteousness he judges and makes war. And his eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no one knew except himself. And he was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. Who could this be but Christ? Christ. Christ will come first for His own. That is spoken of in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 as the rapture or the catching away. That's for His own, the church, the believers. Then at a given point, 
Many believe at the close of the tribulation, He will reveal Himself to the world. This is what is spoken of in Matthew 24 when it says, Every eye shall see Him. And folks, He will reign on the earth for a thousand years. This is known as the millennium or the millennial reign. But at a point beyond the millennium, He will usher in what is known as the eternal state. A new era in creation when time shall be no more. We can't imagine it, can we? If you don't wear a watch, I promise you, you look at your phone to check the time all the time. Y'all have been looking at the time since I've been preaching. <laughs> but there's a day coming when time will be no more. Daniel, in prophesying about the end of the present age, says this in cha Daniel chapter 2, verse 44. And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people. In other words, Christ himself will reign with us, and this kingdom shall consume all kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. It's the kingdom of our Lord. Luke records what the angel Gabriel said to Mary in announcing the incarnation. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. And we will be with Him. He promises us if we have believed on Him and trusted in Him. Jesus' first coming was for the promised hope, the hope of our salvation. His second coming is our blessed hope. And folks, today we need to echo the words of the Apostle John in the next to the last verse of the entire Bible. These are the words. He which testifies of these things says, Surely I come quickly. And John said, Amen. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. Come! Yes. Folks, I promise you, there's nothing on this earth worth missing heaven for. Nothing. Nothing. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. Come, you who gave your life. Come, you who shed your precious blood to redeem us. Come, O oh Savior, whose body was broken and bruised. Come, O oh Holy One, who was despised and rejected of men. Come and rule. Come and reign. Come and have all glory. Come and have all dominion. Come and have all honor. Come and have all power. Come, Lord Jesus. Folks, the only way you can be prepared for His coming when he splits the eastern sky is to say to him, come and split my heart. Come, break my heart over sin. Come and be Savior and blessed Lord. Come, I yield to you. Come because you are worthy. Now folks, before we come to the Lord's table, there needs to be a moment of invitation. Why? Because there may be somebody this morning who needs to come. Spirit and the bride are commanded in the closing verses of the entire Bible, Revelation 22, where we were reading, just, where we were, just after where we were reading. Spirit and the bride say, Come. Maybe you're here this morning and before we come to the Lord's table, there's something between you and God. You need to come and just get right. Confess it to Him. Agree with Him about it. That's what confession really is. Maybe you're here this morning and God's told you this is where you're to be worshiping Him and serving Him. Come. The doors of the church are open. Whatever reason you feel led to come this morning, come while we stand and sing.